JPL in Pasadena today, it's located in Caltech, and it's also affiliated with NASA. So Gerard Holzman is really a very important figure in the field of formal verification, validation, model checking. Um, and he, he is a fellow of JPL, uh, currently a senior research scientist there. And he's leading their reliable software initiative. Uh, Gerard obtained his PhD from Delft University of Technology in Netherlands in 1979. And uh, after coming to North America, he was with Bell Labs for over 20 years, I believe, uh, in New Jersey, uh, and working in their Unix group, actually. He's best known for uh, the popular spin model checking and uh, accompanying language Pramala that is also incidentally used in my testing course. Uh, so I see a lot of students here, which is good. Um, he is uh, pretty well known in that field. In 2001, he won the ACM Software Systems Award uh, for his uh, contribution and his invention of SPIN and Promola. And if you're wondering that what that award is about, it's a pretty important award. And it's uh, that puts Gerard in the same category as the likes of the inventors of things like Unix, Java, Tickle TK, TCP IP, uh, Apache, and, and so on. So yeah, if you've developed anything really important, then you're on that list. Okay. So without further ado, let's welcome Gerard. Well, thank you. Um, actually, thinking at that uh, about what what Hagan just said, uh, I got my PhD. I got my master's in '76 and my PhD in '79. Uh, no laptops, no iPhone, uh, no internet to speak of, um, uh, no desktops. Uh, that that all started around 1980, 1981. So the work environment and the environment for doing research was very, very different from what we're used to now and what, what you're growing up with, uh, and not in a positive way. Right? So it's a lot easier to do uh, this type of work now than it was back then. Uh, much more emphasis on theory in those days. So maybe that got me into uh, a formal uh, analysis and formal verification. Um, uh, things are very different now, but much better now. Uh, so uh, you may remember. A couple of years ago, uh, in August uh, 2012, that we landed a very large object on the surface of Mars. Um, and the, the mechanism that was used for that landing was different from anything that had been used before. Um, the, the mission itself um, uh, required a lot of planning, uh, as you can imagine. So you can think of the Earth as this, this uh, sphere tumbling in space, rotating and uh, on its axis and rotating around the sun. And Mars uh, as uh, one neighboring planet doing the same thing, but in a different orbit at a different speed um, and, and uh, moving through, through space in that way. If you want to do a pinpoint landing at a particular point on Mars, on the surface of Mars, and of course leaving from a particular point on Earth, um, the latter is easy to control where you launch from, but exactly at what moment you launch is, is really critical and making sure that you land at the right point with everything hitting and orbiting each other is, is quite a feat. Um, so luckily, uh, people are good at that and uh, calculating these trajectories. So here you see um, uh, the, the trajectory that the MSL uh, rover, the Mars Science Lab rover, took uh, after launch in November of 2011, uh, going to Mars and landing there on August 5, 2012. And you see that um, uh, you can only do a mission like that when Mars and Earth are relatively close uh, in their orbits. Since, since they have different speeds in their orbits, uh, once every two years, they're close enough together that, they, that you can do one of these missions in a reasonable to, to keep the travel time from Earth to Mars reasonable. But you still see that this trajectory, basically, uh, it, it's as if both Earth and Mars and, and uh, the rover are falling around the sun and basically making almost a complete 180 degree 
uh, 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 trip around the sun. The gravity helps a lot, and, uh, and then, then you have this landing. 350 million miles traveled. Now, of course, that's not uh, the light distance, uh, like a straight line distance. But at the moment of landing, the distance was still large enough that uh, the one-way light time is about 20 minutes. Now, the landing itself takes about seven minutes. That means that the whole process has to be completely automated. You cannot intervene in that process. If anything goes wrong, things will happen. You're fairly sure to get to the surface of, of Mars, but you're, you're not very sure whether you have a mission after that point. So when you see the pictures of the control room at JPL with all the people in blue shirts uh, uh, being there for the landing and wringing their hands and looking very worried about anything that might go wrong, because those people know a lot more about everything that could go wrong than anybody else, but they can do absolutely nothing other than watch, right? Because by the time we got the signal that the landing has, has taken place, it actually took place 20 minutes earlier. So there's nothing you can do at that point. Now, this, this particular landing uh, uh, got a lot of publicity. Uh, so picture from people on Times Square watching the landing live, but not really live, right? 20 minutes after it really happened. Um, was was a really a major event because th this was such an unusual mission. Uh, the rover, the, the, the amount of mass that was, was being landed on uh, the surface of Mars was at the edge of what was technically possible. Uh, the atmosphere on Mars is very different from, from uh, on Earth. The gravity is different. So you cannot really test anything like that very reliably. Uh, the only way, the only accurate test is the actual landing itself, because that, that's in right, with the right gravity and through the atmosphere. So um, we had this sky crane landing, lots of moving parts. Uh, there were many different stages, parts of, of this mission. The, the, the cruise stage, of course, there's the launch vehicle, then there's the cruise stage, uh, the descent stage, and the rover itself, which was lowered by a wire from the descent stage to the surface of Mars, where the descent stage has thrusters that would slow down the rover and then slowly lower it uh, to the surface of Mars, where it then set down the rover, uh, hopefully in, in, in one piece. And now here on this picture, you can see these blast marks from the landing. So here you see the descent stage with the thrusters slowing down the rover. And you see these uh, in the picture that was taken after the landing, you see these blast marks on the surface, like where, where the thrusters were, were firing and lowering this rover on the surface of Mars. So now uh, what this talk is really about is, is this particular question. How do you make sure that it's going to work? given that testing something like this in, in a, an accurate environment is, is pretty much impossible. Right? You have to do a lot of simulations and a lot of testing on the ground before you can launch a mission like this and, and have a reasonable chance that it will succeed. So obviously, there's a lot of testing of the hardware that's being done. So this picture is, is taken in a vacuum chamber before you know, they, they uh, made it vacuum, so with the door still open. Uh, lots of testing. So one of the facilities they have for testing is called Shake and Bake, where they, they simulate vibrations, not simulate, but, but uh, subject the vehicle to, to vibrations and, and check that no bolts will fall out and wires don't break. And also they, they heat up spacecraft from one side and cool it down on the other side to simulate the conditions uh, in space when it's in cruising towards uh, Mars with a pretty uh, serious radiation environment. So here in this picture, you also see the RTG element. So this was the first rover that didn't use solar panels, but used uh, nuclear decay, plutonium pellets uh, decay producing uh, heat, which is then uh, converted into uh, electricity with a very inefficient process, but it's the best process uh, we know, that in this case powers the rover. So this particular rover could uh, survive for a very long time on the surface of Mars because these RTGs will last uh, for, for decades. So here, for with hardware testing, this is an art, but it is a well understood art. Uh, then you move into the software area, and this is also an art, but now it becomes a black art with that nobody really fully understands uh, how you, you uh, 
make sure that the software will not fail. And, and we see that in, in many areas of uh, software development, not just with spacecraft, but uh, automobiles, uh, banking systems, basically any, any area of application is now dependent on the correct functioning of software. And we're all familiar with the types of things that can go wrong. Now this, in addition, is not a simple software system. It's the most complex system that we ever launched. 2.8 million lines of code, that by an order of magnitude more than anything we've flown before. This mission, for instance, has more software, control software on board than all previous missions to Mars combined. Now, so this is, this is impressive, right, for this mission, but the same has been true for all previous missions. And, and that means that the amount of software that we use to fly these missions increases exponentially fast. That's almost the definition of exponential increase. It's, every new mission has more code than all the previous missions before it. So that has been true up to this point, and we believe it will be true again for the next mission. So in 2020, we will land another rover on Mars, in this case, the same size. Um, it'll have more software, and, and we'll see if, if it has more software than all previous missions combined. So uh, there's a lot of concurrency, 120 parallel threads of execution that run uh, uh, as uh, tasks in the VxWorks operating system with priority-based scheduling. Um, so concurrency problems uh, abound. Race conditions, deadlocks, uh, data corruption, all these things can happen, and we want to exclude those things from happening, of course. There are two CPUs. Uh, they don't share the, the load uh, on, on the, 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 of these tasks. So you could say 60 threads you can execute on one CPU and 60 on the other. That would increase the level of complexity of this mission so much that it was decided not to do that. So we use one CPU and the other one is a standby. There's only one phase of the mission where both CPUs were on at the same time, and that was during the landing. If you have any problem during the landing, so the, the landing is very precisely timed where things have to happen on the millisecond, uh, like firing thrusters, firing a parachute, cutting the line to the parachute, doing all these things. Uh, and if it doesn't happen ex exactly the right moment, then you crash onto the surface. Um, or, or you bounce off the atmosphere and go, go on and miss the planet altogether. So for the EDL phase, entry, descent, and landing, we had both CPUs on at the same time, one watching the other. So if the, the controlling CPU would have hit a reset, the other CPU would have taken over. But that's the only phase of the mission. And these, these CPUs run at about 200 megahertz because they're radiation hardened. They run very, very slowly. So compared to what you have in your iPhone, it's about an order of magnitude uh, less capable. Five years of development time for this mission with about 40 uh, developers. Now, 40 is maybe a little bit of an overstatement because the, the, the number of developers varied throughout the, the, the development time. At its peak, there were 40 developers on this mission, but uh, longer, earlier in the process, uh, there were maybe 25 to 30, and then later uh, it also dropped back down to about 30, and then you have more testers. Um, if you work that out, uh, five years of development time for 2.8 million lines of code comes out to about 10 lines of code per hour. Now, I bet that any one of you can write more than 10 lines of code in an hour, right? You can certainly do that. You can write hundreds, thousands of lines in a day. So where does all that go? All that time goes into testing. So writing the code is the easy part. Testing it to make sure that it works and, and verifying it in, in certain cases, that's where all the effort goes. And so the processes that we have at JPL for checking that the code is actually going to do precisely what we mean it to do and that what we mean it to do is actually the right thing, that's where all the time goes. One customer, one use, and basically you cannot test it in its, in its natural environment. So uh, has to work the first time. So this development model is the complete opposite of what any other software industry can do. Um, if you look at Oracle or Microsoft, they can release code with known bugs and, and with unknown bugs because they have tens of thousands, some, in some cases millions, of testers that work for free for them and that report things and then they get fixed. 
in a mission like this, you cannot do that, right? If there's a bug in flight, it can be fatal. It can cost you the mission. This particular mission cost a little over $2 billion. If this one had failed, it could have closed down JPL. So a lot of people have been very, very worried and anxious that this mission would succeed. So getting it right. Uh, for this mission, so since this mission was so complex and so big and so important and so costly, we did a lot of things differently from the missions before it. So JPL has done a number of successful landings on Mars, more than any, any other organization, including other countries. Uh, but the stakes get higher and higher. Right? Once you start flying a few million lines of code, it becomes really, really important that you get things right. So the first thing we did was introduce a new coding standard. Now you might say, well, okay, is this a big deal? Uh, every mission has a coding standard, and that is true. So at JPL, every mission and every project has a coding standard, and it's a different one for every mission and project. That means that up to this point, every project would start by, by picking their favorite rules and dropping the rules that they didn't like and coming up with their own coding standard that mostly consisting about regulating the use of white space, like the stuff that has no semantics where you put your curly braces, whether you put a space between an open brace or not, uh, whether you start a curly brace on a new line or not, uh, where do you put comments and things like that. Most coding standards are dominated by these stylistic rules that just make it easier for people to read each other's code a little bit. Uh, but they have very few rules that actually have to do with risk, like things that might go wrong. So the first thing we did was to say, well, that we do full, Two things. Uh, yeah, one thing that I didn't mention is most of these coding standards, the developers never read them, right? And why why do they get away with not reading them? Because nobody ever checks. So we did two things with this mission. One is we came up with a coding standard and coding rules that was minimalistic, but every rule was related to a known risk. So what we did was take an inventory of everything that had gone wrong in previous missions related to software find the root cause of those uh, anomalies and come up with a rule that said we can prevent that in future missions. So you, when you categorize all these root causes, you come up with only about five different root causes, the different categories. So if you come up with ways to prevent those five categories of errors, then you should be ahead of the curve. So that's what we did. We defined a risk-based coding standard. Every rule is based on reducing risk not stylistic, so there are no rules in there that, that tells people where to put their faces or where to put their comments. Every rule in there relates to a risk, and if a developer wants to argue with the rule, say, I don't like that rule, why do I need to follow it? And we can say, well, we lost this mission because somebody wasn't following that rule. And that's that's very compelling, right? That that can, can uh, convince people very quickly. The second thing is that we decided not to put any rules in this coding standard that we couldn't verify automatically. So if it's not a rule that you can check mechanically whether somebody complies with the rule or not, then you might as well not have the rule because people are not going to follow it. People figure that out real quickly, right? So whether somebody's checking or not. Uh, lot, lots of other examples I can give uh, of that, and you will be familiar with that. With that. So if your parents tell you not to do something, but they're never checking, you're not going to do it, right? That's the same principle with software development. So every rule in there, we have a check. And we can. And every night, we check whether all the rules are being complied with. And if one, any one rule is not being complied with, the next day, the developer gets this, this message, you have to fix this, right? you have to comply. Second thing we did was to introduce a certification program for software developers where we introduced this, this new rule that, that people were initially very wary of that said, well, you cannot touch flight software unless you pass this course. And the course has an exam at the end, and not everybody passes that exam. So the picture on, on the left here is the first class of flight software developers that passed uh, the cert that, that obtained their certification. And that's, that's a, a number of years ago, so by now, uh, all flight software developers have, uh, have uh, gotten their certification. And, and some had to do you know, the exam more than once to, to get qualified, and some never passed. And, and so they cannot touch flight software. Um, we introduced source code analysis. 
And uh, so, of course, we, we do research on static source code analysis. We, we write some tools ourselves, but there are very, very good uh, commercial uh, tools that are, are, are uh, really good at, at uh, what they do. And, and we use more than one. So there's another principle. We don't trust one tool. We don't put all our eggs in one basket. All these tools have complementary skills. Some tools excel at a particular type of, of uh, coding defect, detecting that and others at different types of problems. So we, we use uh, two, three, in this case, four different static analyzers. Only one of them I wrote myself, that's Uno, that's the first one. Uh, Coverity, Semel, and CodeZone are commercial products, and they're not cheap, but we, we use them uh, on all our flight code. So all flight code, every line of code, uh, is checked with these static uh, code analyzers, and, and we want zero warnings uh, at the end before we launch. Uh, one of the things we did was to introduce a new code review process that is based on the use of these static analyzers and the use of peer code reviewers. Now, if you look at 2.8 million lines of code, there, there are lots of studies have been done about the effectiveness of peer code review. And most of these studies conclude that the optimal amount of code for a single peer code review session is about 100 to 200 lines of code. So then you can really look at that. You can do a walkthrough, and you can find most of the problems in the code review. Now somebody gives you 2.8 million lines of code, and you have 40 people who understand that code. And then you can calculate uh, when you can launch. Right? If you want to review that 2.8 million lines of code, 100 lines at a time with 40 people, you can launch somewhere in, in 2050. Uh, so that's not going to happen. right? So, so it becomes at this code size and this level of complexity, it becomes very difficult to do a genuine code, peer code review with, with some integrity. So what we did is we integrated uh, tools, static uh, code analyzers, but lots of other tools that check for uh, routine types of things, like compliance with the coding standard, standard types of coding errors, like frequent coding errors where people misunderstand uh, uh, the semantics of the language. And uh, an example of the latter is um, the, 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 the precedence of operators, especially binary operators, in the C programming language. If you, if you ask developers, do you know what the precedence of, of these operators is, and you give them examples, all of them will say, yes, I understand. And they will uh, 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 happily identify for you so you can give them some expressions with, with a mix of operators without parentheses, and you tell them to put the parentheses in the way this will be evaluated. Um, the results of those, those experiments are always fascinating because everybody feels confident that they know exactly how something gets evaluated. And um, in every study that has been done, uh, when people put in the parentheses to say, this is how it will evaluate, they are wrong more than half the time. Not only that, the people who are very experienced, so if you can ask them, how many years of experience do you have in writing C code? The more experience you have, the more often you're wrong. And, and so the, the, the explanation for that is, the more experience you have, the more confident you are that you are right, but the, the less often you're actually right. So one of our rules is you always put all the parentheses in that enforce the way that something gets evaluated. You don't trust your instinct, even though you believe in your own uh, knowledge of, of uh, operator precedence. Should rely on that because you know. And, and so these are, these are the types of things we teach them in the certification courses. That uh, look, you think you know, and we do the test and we show them. Actually, more than half the time you're wrong. So just put the parentheses in. Um, and then, so part five, small part of what we did was to introduce a formal analysis of key parts of uh, uh, the, the Rover software using logic model checking techniques. And basically, we're not stuck, we're not confined to logic model checking techniques. We will use any formal analysis technique that works. Uh, logic model checking we have the most experience with, so that's what we have used the most. There were several subsystems of the Rover uh, where people were uncomfortable with uh, uh, whether or not there, there might be race conditions or deadlocks or causes for a data corruption, where we did a formal analysis to show that, yes, indeed, uh, their, their level of this common 
discomfort was justified because we could show them how race conditions could happen and then we could fix them. We could rewrite that code. So um, just a little bit about the coding standard. So I'll, I'll talk mostly about the formal, formal analysis part, uh, but I'll, I'll say a little bit uh, about uh, the coding standard. Uh, so we tried to keep that really minimal. So rather than having a coding standard with hundreds of rules that nobody remembers, we decided to have uh, a, a coding standard with very few rules that are directly risk related where we have mechanical checks. So the first attempt at that was this, this column that I wrote for IEEE computer called the power of 10, where uh, I did this experiment. I, la I asked lots of people, developers uh, at JPL and elsewhere, saying, well, we all know all these coding, st coding standards and the types of things we get wrong in writing code. Uh, if you only pick 10 rules, um, only 10 rules, so you don't get 300 rules, but you only get 10 rules. Uh, but those rules will be verified and they will be complied with. Which 10 rules would you pick? So we asked a lot of people and there, there, there was a lot of consensus that we didn't expect about which 10 rules uh, people would pick. So that led to this, this uh, column called the power of 10. Uh, so now you have a coding standard of 10 rules only that most people can remember. There are other uh, famous examples of rule sets that have only 10 entries. And, and you can remember at least a few of those. And if, if I would test you on that, probably you couldn't remember all of them. But you have a better chance of remembering that than if there are hundreds of rules. Now, we actually decided to expand that, expand that. So this was in 2006. The coding standard that we introduced at JPL was introduced in 2009 and had a few extra rules that were more specific to the development of flight software. So there are 32 rules uh, at level of compliance four. So another thing we did was we, we said, well, we're not going to do an all or nothing approach. We say you either comply with all the rules we can think of uh, or it doesn't count. We did something similar to what CMMI does in their uh, compliance process, but different levels of compliance. So we defined uh, five, uh, six levels of compliance. Level of compliance one applies to all software written at JPL. Whether it's for emission or not, doesn't matter. Whether it's support software, whether it's safety critical or not, doesn't matter. All software written at JPL must comply with a level of compliance one. Now, there are only two rules at, at level one, and those rules are very straightforward. It says you must be able to compile your code without warnings, with all warnings turned on in pedantic mode. So if you use the GCC compiler, it is minus capital W all. All warnings are turned, turned on minus pedantic, meaning even be picky about it. And then we expect zero warnings from the compiler. That means that when we compile flat code, we map warnings to errors. So if somebody triggers a warning by rewriting a piece of code or writing a piece of new code, it stops the build and people hate that, right? It breaks the build. There's a nightly integration build. That build fails if somebody has a compiler warning, no matter how silly it is. Complaining about like a format specifier in an output statement, it will stop the build. Uh, and, and there are consequences for breaking the build. Uh, and every company has a different mechanism. So I think at Lockheed Martin, uh, the penalty for breaking the build is that you get a poster of Britney Spears in your cubicle for that day. People hate that. At, at SpaceX, the penalty is that you get a large life-size cutout of Justin Bieber in your cubicle, standing in your cubicle. They, they figured out more people hate Justin Bieber than, than Britney Spears. Um, at JPL, uh, we had a wall of shame. So your name became uh, came on the wall of shame for that day. And so people don't like that. So level of compliance two is predictable execution. And that, that basically means you must be able to show, not only do you have to be able to show that every loop in your code terminates, but a tool must be able to verify that all your loops are terminating. So you don't get a runaway code. And so that's one of the rules. There are several other rules at that level but all uh, based on predictable execution. Third one is defensive coding. Like if you write a module and you invoke functionality in libraries or in other modules, you do not trust those other modules. So it's controlled paranoia where you protect yourself against things that break in other people's code. So it's defensive principles and then level of four, 
compliance means code cl clarity. So you write your code in such a way that your, your colleague has a chance of understanding it. And that means you don't try to write the code as sophisticated and as clever as you can think of, because then the next guy who has to fix it when something goes wrong will not understand it and will introduce other bugs if he tries to fix it. So the code is written as clearly and as simply as it possibly can. So then there are two more levels of compliance. So we, we require level of compliance level four uh, for all flight code, for all mission critical flight code at JPL. So for MSL, MSL complied with level four uh, um, compliance. And now if it's human rated code, we add two extra levels which is all the required rules at the Misra C in our, in this case, the 2004 standard. Meanwhile, there's an update of that standard. There are really guidelines used for uh, uh, automobiles, software used in automobiles. So it's now the Misra C 2012 uh, guidelines, uh, but we, we still have uh, 2004 as our guideline. Uh, then you also must comply with those rules. And every single rule, so 32 rules at level four can be machine checked for compliance. Now, a couple of small examples. I gave you this one, uh, so no compiler warnings uh, allowed. That's a much bigger deal than, than you would think because that rule did not exist until we introduced it for MSL. All previous missions had thousands of compiler warnings that everybody ignored. So when we started, uh, you see a couple, couple of years back from the, the launch, uh, tracking the number of compiler warnings and static analyzer warnings, you see that it took a long time. It took several years to get the number of compiler warnings down to zero, but eventually it did happen. And then with static analyzer warnings, it took a little longer. We also want zero static analyzer warning from, from three or four different static analysis tools. Um, so we have a very low ratio at this point. Uh, this was uh, uh, about a, a year or so before launch. Um, very few static analyzer warnings remaining and zero compiler warnings. So now all missions uh, comply with that rule. Rule 16 uh, had, uh, had the, the rule that there should be uh, assertions throughout the code. And then we have a minimum assertion density requirement that says there should be at least 2% uh, assertion density, meaning two out of every 100 lines of code should be a check, a self-check that things are sane. Uh, and that is incredibly important. So it means that testing is much more effective. Uh, you find errors earlier and closer to where the error happens in the code. Um, on all previous missions, assertions were used very sporadically. It was in, in the order of a few per 10,000 lines of code. Um, and they were turned off uh, at launch. Uh, so they were not actually checking during the mission itself. So we introduced this rule that at least 2% assertion density, and you never turn off the assertions, not even during landing. So the assertions stay enabled throughout the mission. The first mission where that was done, uh, and uh, uh, I think it, it contributed significantly to the quality of the code. So here's some, some motivating information. So at Microsoft, they did a study for Microsoft Office code where they try to find a correlation to check to see if there was a correlation between fault density and assertion density in Microsoft Office code. So this PowerPoint, uh, Excel, Outlook, and, and things like that. And so the graph from their paper you see here in the middle at the bottom, uh, you see a very strong correlation. So one axis is the number of faults per 1,000 lines of code. And one, uh, which is reported, right, by users. When, when something goes wrong, your PowerPoint session crashes and you get this box saying, would you like to send this error to Microsoft? They get thousands of these every day, goes into a database, and then they can do the correlation. Like, how many assertions per 1,000 lines of code were there in that module? And you see the plot. Like, there's a strong correlation between fault density and assertion density. More assertions, which means fewer faults in the field. Um, so that, that's very effective. Now, this is the plot uh, where I plotted assertion density for three missions. MER, which was the, the rover that landed uh, on, on Mars in 2004. Uh, MSL, which is the mission I'm talking about, landed in 2012. 
and SMAP, which is an Earth orbiter, which was a, a mission, the, the first mission when, that was done after MSL. And uh, you, show, you see the assertion densities for MER is basically zero. Right? It's, it's like almost not measurable. MSL, uh, well above 2% are our, our guideline, uh, our minimum. Uh, SMAP uh, was much higher still. And so we're on a trend where we're, uh, we're improving code and making it more robust and more reliable. And we have the support of developers and, and of management to push this. So the green line is at 2%. Uh, lots have been written about uh, on Microsoft. So Tony Hoare wrote a paper about the use of assertions in Microsoft Office code. And so for Microsoft, it is 1% assertion density that they measure. It's not a guideline, uh, but it's just what they, they have in their code. So we figured we have to do at least better than Microsoft. Right? We write flight code, and it's mission critical. It should be more robust than, than Office code. So 2% is sort of a compromise. Now, uh, the, the, the last thing that I'll give as an example is that for our code review process, we require that every single finding, whether it's produced by a tool, like a static analyzer or any of the checking tools that we use, uh, or by a human, like a peer code reviewer. We have formal peer code review sessions as well. Every single finding must be fixed, either fixed or justified why it's not fixed. So we, we require a written justification when something doesn't get fixed. And that is discussed uh, in detail at uh, uh, closeout sessions for modules. That means that it becomes easier to fix something rather than to explain why you're, you're not going to fix it. Plus, it doesn't leave. A, if you just fix it, it doesn't leave a record in our system that you try to explain why it shouldn't be fixed. It leads to, later leads to the loss of the mission that we can point back, like, ah, he refused to fix it and he was wrong. Right? So you don't want that. If you're the, so this all the incentive here is fix it. Right? Don't argue. Just fix it. And so that that worked really well. So here I, I, on this little graph, you can't really read the detail, but it's also not too important. Uh, there were on on this on this MSL mission, five uh, at this point 500,000 lines of code had been reviewed in 130 modules. Not all modules made it into the flight load. Um, 20,800 reports and 16,700. Uh, am I reading that right? Yeah, 16,800 roughly uh, were acted upon, led to a change in the code. So now the, the bars, the the the, the gold bar is for uh, uh, peer comments, uh, and uh, the blue bar is for tool-generated work. There were roughly even, uh, equal numbers of those. And um, it also shows how many of those were acted upon is roughly 80% in both cases. Uh, so the vast majority of these, these comments were uh, acted upon. So in the few cases where the developer disagreed, they were Pretty certain, right? They have a very had a very good case why they should not fix uh, something, and that got documented. Okay, so now uh, I'll move into formal analysis. Um, the question now is, uh, what is the state of the art? Of course, we want to do the best possible job here that we can do, and I'll I'll just give one example, and and the example is representative of the field. So it's not like oh, I found this one case that's kind of bizarre. This is roughly uh, the state of the art. Paper, this paper was published in 2000. Uh, title was Even Better DCAS Based Concurrent DEX. So, this is about verification of concurrent code, not sequential code. DCAS is a double word compare and swap instruction. And so, this, this paper showed how you can build a reliable uh, double sided queue uh, with a double uh, word compare and swap instruction and, and make it correct. So, in a queue, it's important you can't lose information, you can't have duplicate information in the queue. Everything you put in the queue as a double-sided queue, you can push it in from the right or from the left, and you can pop it out from the right or from the left with multiple threads of operation. So now you need really a proof of correctness. So they have that proof of correctness in their paper. Um, it took about a few months. They're not very precise about it, but a couple of months to produce that proof. And uh, actually, in the paper, since the proof itself was too long, it, they included a sketch, which was five pages, seven lemmas and five theorems, carefully checked by the, the uh, reviewers on this paper and published. So since the, the proof was, was reasonably 
pretty well described in the algorithm. The C code for the algorithm was in the paper. Uh, this became a popular thing for people to look at. So in 2004, a, a master's student in Australia decided to, to take that same proof and put it in a, in a theorem prover, PVS in his case, to, to reproduce the proof with the theorem prover. It took him about three months, and he couldn't get it to work. And he was really frustrated trying to push this, this uh, proof through the theorem prover until he realized that actually the algorithm was incorrect, and so was the proof. Uh, so he discovered the flaw, uh, proposed a fix, and uh, he actually did something unusual. Uh, he contacted the authors of the first paper and said, mm, I found a problem in your algorithm and in your proof, rather than just publishing a paper saying, ha ha, you know, you were wrong, and I know better than you. So he actually contacted the authors. They, they talked about this, and together, jointly, they published a new paper in 2004 with the corrected version of the algorithm and the, the correct version of the proof in PVS. It took him three months. Uh, Leslie Lampert uh, saw this, and he thought, I can do better in uh, TLA. So he did a TLA plus proof, and he writes that uh, he did that in a few days. Now, of course, these are Leslie Lampert days, so they are uh, it's, it's a shorter amount of time than ordinary mortals uh, would take to reproduce the same proof. Now, my question is at this point, um, and of course, he could use the earlier results. He had the PVS proof, he had the correct algorithm, uh, and he just had to convert everything into a TLA proof. Uh, question is, is it any easier today? So you can see, well, we went from a few months to three months to a few days by an expert user. Uh, is it a few hours now? Is it a few minutes? Is it five years from now, is it a few seconds? And the observation is, of course, there is no Moore's law for manual proofs. And there is no Moore's law for theorem prover proofs. If you use PVS or Boyer Moore or any of, of the existing theorem provers, if you want to do this proof for a new algorithm, it will take you three months to do it. If you want to do that five years from now, it will take you three months to do it. If you want to do it 10 years from now, it will take you three months to do it. And we don't like that, right? Because we do not have three months. You have, have 2.8 million lines of code. It's going to get launched, say, next year. We don't have three months because at the end of the three months, the code is different. They change it. So uh, this we want to do something about. So that's, that's what the rest of my talk is about. So here's the DCAS algorithm. So I'm talking about this example because I cannot talk about flight code. There are ITAR rules about flight code. That means it cannot be disclosed, not even within JPL. Most people don't have access to the code. Uh, unless you're on the flight solver team, you cannot see the, the code because it's a protected artifact. But of course, the, the, the procedure for verifying, for formally verifying code is the same no matter what the purpose of the code is. So I'll take this exa example. Take the algorithm as it appeared in uh, the paper. So it's C code, and well, OK, here, here's the. Uh, uh, a C version of an atomically executing a double word compare and swap instruction. And here's the push write and the pop write routines from the paper without changes. That's how they wrote it. And, and of course, it has a bug, that, as we now know. But it's, it's not an obvious bug, because it took people many, many months to discover this bug. So the, the, the authors didn't see it. The reviewers on the paper didn't see it. The grad student doing the PVS proof didn't see it until he couldn't make the proof work. So those, that's the code. And now what we want to do is add a test driver to this code. So we, when we want to produce this proof, we want to write Moore's Law. Right? We want to make this faster and easier with every new generation of uh, uh, PCs and, and, and computers. So if you increase the clock speed, I want to have this proof go faster. If you add more cores, I want to have this proof go faster. So I don't want to be stuck in, in, uh, in time with the, the amount of effort it takes. So um, I add test drivers that any C programmer can write. Right When they test that code, they can write these drivers. So you push some. So here I push 10 elements at the bottom. I have a test uh, writer that pushes 10 elements into the queue using the push write routine. And at the, uh, in the middle, I have a sample reader that pops uh, these same 10, 10 elements out of the queue again. Uh, so you can use it at testing, and you can run it a million times, and it may never fail. Right? And so it doesn't prove anything 
but it, it gives you some confidence. Then I add an assertion that says, well, what I push into the queue, I get back out as well. So it's just an assertion that I'm not losing anything, I'm not duplicating anything. Uh, my test actually checks something. Like if, if you don't check anything, of course, it can't fail at all other than crash and dump core. But it, now I have an assertion that, that has to be uh, valid. Then you know I have uh, uh, a simple heap allocator. Since I have to give this to a model checker, it has to be a closed system. Everything, there's no assumptions about anything outside the system. So I include a heap allocator as well. And this I give to a model extractor. So here, this is the amount of code. It's not a lot of code, 180 lines, uh, 146 if you strip comments and blank lines. And it's a header file with the data structures of 20 lines. So now uh, here, here's the test stuff, the initialization of the queue and the test stuff. And the question is, uh, how do I verify that? And the point I want to be able to get to is to say, verify dcast.c. Don't want somebody have to have to learn spin and promella, as, as useful as that might be, because the more you know, the better you can do these proofs. But I, basically, for the software developer, he's not going to do more than, say, write some test routines and say, verify, verify dcast.c. And report the assertion violation, which we know is there. Right? We, so we have some advantage. We know there's a bug. Just have to be able to find it, and so so I'm saying this is an advantage that I know there's a bug. Uh, I have more to say about that, right? So it may actually not be an advantage, but, but okay, we'll we'll get to that. So uh, here's my run, and I say modex modex minus run dcast.c. So I, I you know, verify is just I give it a different could give it a different name, but basically I give Modex, model extractor, produces a spin model from the C code without my intervention. Well, almost without my intervention. I say modex run dcast.c and it finds an assertion violation. Done, right? And thing is, finds it in 0 0.01 seconds. Not three months, 0 0.01 seconds. Now, altogether, all the steps, like the model extraction step, the generation of a model checker, the compilation of the model checker, running it, all together takes about 10 seconds. But that's still a heck of a lot better than three months, or even a few days of Leslie Lampert time. Um, so um, how does that work? Well, so here's here's that the, the code. And I added one file to it. So here's the same listing, uh, dcast.c, dcast.h. And there's this file, dcast.prx, which is a, a guidance file for the model extractor. But it has only nine lines in it. So there's the code about 200 lines. Uh, it contains the test routines, right, the sample reader and writer. And there's the piece that I add. And I write nine lines. So almost without human intervention means I do have to write those nine lines, but that's it. So what are those nine lines? These are the nine lines. So it's the instruction I give to Modex to say, these functions execute as threads of execution, independent, asynchronously executing threads of execution. So there's push write, pop write, which is what I used in my test. That's that's a thread, two threads, right? And then I have the sample reader and the sample writer. There are also asynchronous threads. So there are two threads in the test routine. And then uh, the push write and pop write are executed by those test routines. But I also model them as independent uh, threads. Then I have the header file with the data structure definition. And I have to link my model checker to dcast.c. So that's the bottom line script, line number nine, says, OK, you need that code as well for other library screens, and so for the heap allocator, et cetera. So the model extractor pre preserves the control flow, but it abstracts the data. So it encapsulates the data into C code statements that the model checker uses as definitions of transitions. Um, so this statement abstraction that actually I can refine by adding more information to this uh, guidance file. So I can define mapping routines that say represent this as something else, like you do abstractions. So it's not necessary here because I already find my uh, uh, assertion violation in 0 0.01 seconds. I don't have to get fancy. So uh, now let's let's take another look at that proof. Right. So here's my test routine, and there's that assertion. Um, now, of course, I've written that, and I know there's a about 
I wrote the assertion and get a counterexample, uh, 0.01 seconds, very happy, shows that the model extractor is fantastic, that it can solve these, these complex problems in very little time. Published a paper about this that appeared in the, the communications of the ACM in February 2014. Uh, and so that paper called Mars Code uh, uh, became very, very uh, popular. It has the largest number of downloads uh, of, of any paper in the CACM. It's close to 100,000, 100, 95,000 downloads at this point. So this is a big deal, right? So this is a big paper, and I thought, well, this is a really important result. Uh, it, it has to be uh, documented, and people have to know about this. So now, OK, here's, here's our queue, double-sided queue. I can push things in from the left and from the right. So I push in 10 elements, numbered 0 through 9, uh, on the right. And then I pop them from the right. And then I check that uh, the numbers are uh, 0 to, through 9. Does anybody see a problem with this? I did not. And 94,998 9, readers of the article didn't see a problem with it. But two of them did. I pushed these things in on the right and popped them off from the right. Which is the first number that I get out? Nine, not zero. So this assertion fails, right? but for the wrong reason. Because this assertion fails if the first number I pop is not zero. And it isn't. It's nine. So that's why this assertion fails. So now this was a brilliant career move, right? Paper in the communications of the ACM. 95,000 people read this paper. Happily, 99.99% of them don't realize that this is actually wrong. My test is wrong. And the reason I didn't see it, nor did anybody else, or that, except for those two really smart people, nor did anybody else see it, is that there was supposed to be a bug. There's supposed to be an assertion violation. So when the assertion violation happened, I think that's it. That's the one. That's the flaw in the argument. But it's not. So two, two readers found this, and I had to publish a correction to the article. I had to fix it. So that had to be a pop left. If you do a pop left, yes, you get them out 0 to 9 in that order. Pop right, you get them out in the reverse order. OK, so now this is kind of embarrassing and takes a little while to get over that. Uh, but then there's sort of a, a, um, a happy ending to this. If this had not happened, I would not have done something else that turns out to be important. So the real verification, if you have just two threads, so I have a sample reader and a sample writer, two threads of execution, there is no bug. And the, the model extractor and spin can now prove that in three seconds. So had I done it right, I would have discovered, oh, my test harness has to be a little more sophisticated. I need more than two threads of execution to exercise this. So the minimum number of threads that you need is three. Now, the reason that those two readers found the problem, they actually didn't find the assertion problem. They just said, but hey, wait a minute. We thought that the algorithm was correct with two threads, and you show a problem. Like, how's that? We don't understand the problem. Uh, so then, you know, look into it. Actually, no, you know, there is no counterexample with just two threads. So you make it three threads, and that becomes intractable. So, oh, great. I picked exactly the wrong example, right? For this, this big publication, I picked the wrong example. But because now it takes more time than Leslie Lampert would take to do it with a theater improver. And that's, I don't like that, right? I don't like it. So now, now of course, I'm, I'm motivated to show that you can still do this in a few seconds. But, but now it's hard. This is a seriously intractable problem. So I let it run for six days. And I killed the verification because I figured it hasn't found it yet. And now I'm not competitive with theater improving anymore. So I have to do something else. Now, there is an experiment that can, that can find the error in 0.2 seconds. And that's the one I want, right? So and this is the experiment. I generate uh, the model, compile it, and uh, run it. But now the trick is I use a randomly generated hash polynomial. So now I don't have enough time to go 
two details of the importance of the hash polynomials in, in uh, model checking, but it is critically important. So um, I use a very small uh, hash arena size of 128 kilobytes. So to solve the full problem takes uh, hundreds of kilo, uh, gigabytes of memory to solve it exhaustively, but it takes too long, right? So now I artificially limit the search using a sampling algorithm called bit state hashing. So that's what I'm using here in a very small hash arena. So now I sample executions, and I may I may not find the error. So the probability that I find the error is very small. And in this case, it's actually 0.2% as well, and no, not, not linked to the 0.2 seconds in any way. Happens to be uh, that there's very low probability. So I actually stumbled upon this. I, I gave uh, hash polynomials to this search, thinking there has to be a faster way. And by sheer luck, I picked a hash polynomial that found the error in 0.2 seconds. But how, how do you guess the hash polynomial? How do you possibly guess that hash polynomial that you, you can't, right? The beauty is you don't have to. You don't have to. And I'll show you how that works. So you have a very large search space, like hundreds of gigabytes large. Uh, that first search fails. because it, So the, the red dots are supposed to be where the errors are. That first search doesn't get to the error. It does systematically from left to right, sweeps, sweeps uh, through the search space, doesn't get to the error. That first search doesn't work because it already runs out of memory before it gets to the error. So the only chance you have to find the error is to do a random search and then hope statistics works in your favor. And you do lots of those. So uh, instead of running one test, you run many tests, each one with a different random seed. So now I don't have to be lucky in guessing the hash polynomial. I use statistics. I run sufficiently many checks. So if it, if Probability of success is 1% for a single run. I run 100 runs or 1,000 runs. And now I'm certain, virtually certain, that I'm going to get it. So when I do 1,000 parallel randomized runs, so all in parallel, they're all completely independent. In a cloud network, I run 100 parallel executions. None of them can run more than, than 0.2 seconds. Two of them find the error. If we do 10,000 of them, 20 of them will find the error. So if I double the size of the hash arena, so I give it more things to search, I also double the probability that it will find the error, but it slows down. If instead I double the number of cores, the number of random tasks that all run at a fixed speed of 0.2 seconds, I also double the odds of finding the error. Now, cloud networks are very large, like they have millions of cores available. To, to do these searches. That means if I do a search like this with very low probability of any individual run finding the error, I'm practically certain of finding it, but just you know running uh, enough cores. So now the next question is, can you actually get to proof? So this is really un unrivaled for bug finding, but can you also do proof? So I did lots of experiments. And so the answer is, yes, you can. And so this, every curve here, is showing a different memory size that I is so of course the more memory you you give the searches uh, the, the higher the odds of finding the error and and the quicker you get to 100% coverage so the interesting curve is the one uh, the lowest curve uh, on the lower uh, right where I give the the searches uh, one megabyte of memory where the full search is a different problem like a garbage collection algorithm concurrent garbage collection I give it four orders of magnitude less memory than is necessary for a full proof that may run for weeks. Four orders of magnitude less memory, so now it completes in seconds. And can I get to 100% coverage? Yes, I can, but it, in this case, it takes me close to a million uh, cores. Now, if you talk to Google about cloud searches, they don't, don't even think about running any experiment with less than a million cores. That's their starting point. So this, this is completely in range with what is uh, going to be feasible. Maybe not yet routinely on desktop use, but it will be. Like five years from now, this is going to be routine. And this is a fantastic way of finding bugs. So coming back to the MSL rover, I'm, I'm out of time too. First year of Mars, this is a trajectory that the rover ran. So in the blue area is where it landed with the blast marks, et cetera. First year of the on the surface of Mars. 
Um, the MER mission, so the predecessor mission, only 600,000 lines of code on that mission, lost almost a month of Earth time due to software bugs. Uh, the MSL mission lost one day due to a single bug in the first year, even though it had six times as much code. Uh, not, not six times, four and a half times as much code and, and highly complex code. So this approach works, right? It, it, it can scale. Now I want to end with this picture, which was one of the first pictures taken on the surface of Mars. And, and to me, this picture is, is just astonishing, right? If you think about what you're looking at here, this may be the most uh, amazing picture ever taken since the invention of photography. And so this sounds like an overstatement, and it probably is, but what you're looking at here is tire tracks starting in the middle of a valley. And so there's a, a truck size vehicle, a, a huge vehicle that drove away. And how did it get there? Like it, it came from the sky, was landed in the middle of this valley and drove away. That in itself is impressive, but it's on a different planet, right? So this is a truck coming down from the sky and driving away. Uh, and this picture captures that beautifully, right? So this, this is, that's the type of work that happens at NASA. Uh, it's just the coolest type of thing. So if you go into formal verification, if you get to work on this type of stuff, this just wins the cake, right? This is beautiful. Okay, that's it. Okay. We're going to take questions. Thank you very much for this really exciting talk. All right. Let's take some questions. I wanted to ask, uh, what is the next big, big thing for you guys at JPL? What are you well, so there is a, a new mission called Mars 2020, which is another landing on Mars. Uh, it is meant to be a duplicate of this rover, uh, just with different instruments. So one of the things that they're planning to have on board, it's not approved yet, but we're working on it, is to put a helicopter on this rover so it can fly away and do scouting. Uh, so we, uh, we have a project for that. So that that's pretty cool. Um, and we did another really big mission that's coming up is uh, Europa which is an orbiter for uh, uh, Europa, one of the planets of Jupiter, uh, with possibly a lander as well that can go uh, into the ocean that we believe is there. Uh, so these things are very cool. That, that's, uh, yeah. 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 A question regarding the assertions, uh, because it's obviously easy to make errors in the assertions themselves. Yes. So. Uh, are kind of rules or in the process that let's say different teams are doing the assertions from the code developers. And the second question I had is what happens if uh, such a co uh, assertion violation happens during runtime? Is it just a reboot or, uh, as you said, moving over to the spare processor or what happens? Yeah, an excellent question. So, yes, you're just as likely to make a mistake in an assertion as in the regular code. But if you make a mistake in the assertion and it file, uh, fires for the wrong reason, then you have a, a trace, you have an example of why it's wrong, you can fix it, so you find out. Um, the requirement we do have about assertions is that they cannot be provably false, false or true. Like you cannot say one equals one as an assertion. That doesn't count, right? Because you can eliminate that from the code. It doesn't uh, help. Um, the, the fact that they're on uh, all the time in all testing that means that they, they, we detect if they can be violated very early on. Um, what happens when they, they fire? So when, when they say this is false and it's supposed to be true. Um, what should happen, uh, and we didn't achieve that, but what should happen is that that is a message to the fault protection system that can say, okay, which module is this? Um, and, and decide what to do. So for instance, if the imaging module is trying to take a picture and hits a false assertion, you could say, okay, shut down the imaging system, but continue, right? You don't have to reboot the whole thing. Uh, and then figure out uh, what the cause was, fix it, and, and continue. Uh, that will be the right thing. So the fault protection system can decide how important that is to the health of the mission. Uh, that's actually not what we're doing. So when, when an assertion fails, it is a reset. And the, the spacecraft comes back up in, in safe mode. So in, in with restricted functionality and basically uh, people
people on have to figure out what happened and bring it back into operation. So it treats it as a major anomaly that shuts everything down, minimal functionality, and it sends a distress signal saying something happened. I don't know what, but now, you know, get me out of here. Works probably except for the lending phase. Well, so I actually expected that they would at least turn off the assertions in the landing phase, but they did not. Because they had the second CPU running, right? so it would switch over to the second CPU. Ah, there's somebody. Oh. Sure, okay. Two microphones. It's so, a race uh, condition, right? <laughs> so, John, you mentioned uh, that. Um, about cloud verification, so like uh, running millions of cores and trying to verify a, a piece of code. Um, can you elaborate on that? Uh, is that like a project that's going on somewhere with you might have worked on, or like how, how does that work? Well, right now this is a research project, so we're trying to find out what are the capabilities and what are the, the limitations. Um, so that this this chart is uh, from a paper that I'll present at uh, VMKI. Uh, in January, so this is all very recent stuff. So it's actually so the finding, like actually, yes, you can. Uh, but the but is, it takes a lot of cores to, to make up. Like if you go down in memory arena, so it means you go up in speed. Like smaller arena, you need much faster. Four orders of magnitude. The price is you need more than a million cores. And so yeah, it's unclear whether that's uh, practical or not. But you know, you, you you increase your chances of finding bugs even if you don't get to excess exhaustive coverage. Yeah. So at JPL, we don't have a million CPUs sitting around, so we have to uh, do something on the Amazon Cloud or the Google Cloud or yeah, something like that, Azure. So people refer to Mars as the graveyard of missions. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about what you learn in this mission? Um, that you can use in future, in future spacecraft, uh, considering all the time and operational constraints that you faced, all of those deadlines. Right. Well, so our effort is to reduce risk, and uh, so it is unfortunate that we typically, and this is true in general, you learn much more from your mistakes than from your successes. So success makes you a little too confident, and you can keep repeating that. If something fails, then you have to figure out in detail why it failed and how you can prevent that. Now, we've had a number of very successful missions since about 2001. When, uh, we've had a lot of very successful missions. We've had a few failures, uh, and so some of them were, were software related. Uh, for instance, one of the recent ones, which is maybe two years ago, we lost the epoxy mission because the, the clock overflowed. Now, it was because it's an extended mission. It was never designed to go that long. And so nobody worried about uh, the, the integer counter overflowing on the clock value. Uh, so that happened and the software crashed and you know, we did not recover that. So we learned something, right? So now every spacecraft, all the software is checked for you know, clock counters, how it's processed, where it goes, and make sure that it cannot overflow. So yes, unfortunately, we'll learn much more from failures. All right. First, can you, in general, talk about you know what's what's in your tool suite uh, to do this kind of thing? The ones that you can talk about. Uh, you mentioned uh, Spin and Modex, and are there any other nifty, nice little tools that you're using? And second, I wanted to know more about the capabilities of Modex in terms of how it's able to get from a really complicated model to a code to a well-abstracted um, model uh, that is guaranteed to preserve certain kinds of properties or be sound with respect to certain kinds of properties. Well, so on, on Modex, probably I have to lower your expectations a little bit. Uh, you can define abstractions, but that's a manual process. So we haven't figured out how to automate abstraction. Right? So that needs human insight about what is relevant and what is not, depending on the property. Uh, now, the, the, the good thing is that we now realize that many applications, including 
the one I talked about, you do not need to perform any abstraction because it'll find the bugs without that too. So it, it can be a fairly coarse model. So uh, what actually happens with Modex is you, you go from very complex C code to even more complex uh, models that, that are hard to, to read. Uh, but you know, as long as it finds the counterexamples, uh, uh, you're good. Uh, for, for tools, uh, we use anything that can get us the result. Right? So we have used theorem provers. Um, we use uh, UPAL uh, where we can. We use SPIN, we use new SMB. Uh, we're not picky. Right? We, we want uh, to obtain a result and whatever tool can get us the result. And we also do tool development. So static analyzers can be very powerful. Uh, so we're doing research on how can you improve that, how can you make it faster. Um, if it's not fast, you know, if the performance is not adequate, then it doesn't get used for that reason. So you want fast, reliable results. And this is a wide open field. Actually, I continue to be amazed how, how uh, persistent this, this particular area of research is. As so we've been working on this, I started on this in, in 1979. Um, and this is still a vibrant area of research where basically it is never done, right? There's always new insights, new improvements uh, that you can leverage in building tools and, and finding interesting applications. Uh, so this, this, if you go into this type of, of area, it is employment for life, right? And especially on missions like, like this or safety critical applications in, in the, the medical industry, uh, medical devices are driven by software. The automotive industry is driven by software. Uh, financial industry is all driven by software. Everybody is scared to death of of bugs and and what they could cause, like the the damage that could be done by any anyone in any one of these systems by a, a, a minimal like one line mistake uh, are are devastating. So lifetime employment uh, if you go into this area. Plus it's pretty exciting uh, too. It's uh, it's interesting stuff and challenging. Uh, let's go to Gora, and then we'll take one more question, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Okay. Well, that's a perfect question. That's the right question to ask, and we ask that question a lot. So one rule we have is that the tester, the test cases have to cover 100% of the code, which is not always easy, right? Because some of the code is defensive code, where basically the cases that can't happen when the system executes correctly. It can only happen if something bizarre goes wrong. If you want 100% test coverage of your code, then you have to trigger those bizarre conditions as well. Now, how do you know that you've done enough? Uh, you don't, and, and we have to live with that. So we do our best. We try the best. Tests are peer-reviewed, and uh, we want 100% code coverage. We don't often get there. Like It's like typically 95% uh, until you get to the can't happen cases. Um, but yeah, so formal analysis is really important because it's an added arrow uh, that we can use to, to hunt down the types of things that if they happen, uh, it's like drawing uh, the lottery, right? It's like a very bizarre execution scenario that no sane person would think of testing. Uh, so that's why model checkers are, are really good. Good question. Uh, you talked about the, the rules that you put in for uh, the different levels of rules. Uh, how do you make sure that a new rule that you put in because of past failures doesn't create new problems? That, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, in reality, so there are all these different levels of um, abstraction here. So this is a meta level. Of like, how do you verify that what you're verifying is the right thing to verify? And, and when you verify that, how do you know that that verification? Because what if it's, a, if it's a losing battle? You add new rules that they, they call they cause more problems. Well, I mean, we have lots of smart people around, and they would 
point that out real quick. So basically, we do not know. You have to rely on human judgment and smart people noticing these types of things. So yes, it can happen. And then we just have to... Have notice. you guys ever come across a case that you actually had to change the compiler or like update GCC to work? We try not to do that. So once once you start development, we don't change any tool in our tool chain, uh, not to newer versions of the compiler, because there's risk, right? There's risk. So even if like it's an improvement, uh, like, uh, we try not to. So it needs to be very very strong reasons to change any like operating system or version or or compiler. We we tend not to do it. So the next mission can pick the new version, but uh, we we stick with one tool set. Okay, well, thank you very much. So there's going to be coffee and food, uh, snacks outside. Gerard is going to hang around for a little while.